You'll see our scripture passage today comes from two different places in Isaiah, and so I invite you to hear these words, starting in chapter 6, verse 3. It says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heavenly forces. All the earth is filled with God's glory. Then as we turn to Isaiah 60, we pick up in verse 2. Well, we'll start in verse 1 just so you can get the context. It says, Arise, shine, your light has come. The Lord's glory has shone upon you. Though darkness covers the earth and gloom the nations, the Lord will shine upon you. God's glory will appear over you. Nations will come to your light and the kings at your dawning radiance. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Gracious God, allow these words to be yours and not mine. Open our hearts to grow deeper in our understanding of you and who you have called us to be. Create in us a heart that strives to proclaim your glory and live a life that honors you. It's in your holy name that I pray. Amen. So if you've been with us for the last five weeks, you will know that we are coming to the end of our Sola series. We started with scripture where we learned that all things necessary for salvation, those truths that we need, are found in scripture. And then we learned about God's grace and how God's grace continually pours upon God's people. In those moments of darkness and in light, we were reminded to call on our faith and how it is through faith alone that we receive salvation. And and that ability was provided for us through Christ alone, in Christ's death on a cross. And so today we come to sola deo gloria, God's glory alone. This is a topic that I can think back to my seminary classes and my undergraduate in religion and those years I spent in the youth group, and I don't ever remember sitting down for a lesson on God's glory. It was just something that was talked about. Yeah, for God's glory this and to the glory of God over here, but there's really no further explanation, and so I kind of just moved on. And through my own study, I've learned a lot about glory, but I experienced something pretty remarkable this past weekend. You see, at the end of May, I am going to be one of the spiritual directors for a youth retreat for our conference, and this weekend we had a staff training. Now, this retreat is run entirely by teenagers with a few token adults to make sure things don't get out of hand. And as we sat in a circle with these kids who were 15 to 18 years old, the question was asked, why do you think you are led to serve this weekend, because there's sacrifices that have to be made. There's absolutely no sleep that happens. There's a lot of work. So why do you feel like you were called to serve this staff? And time and time again, the kids talked about, well, it's been a rough year. I think we can all agree it's been a rough year, and I just needed something to hold on to. I just needed something full of joy and full of hope. And then the next kid would say, well, you know, I didn't know if we'd ever get to do this again. I didn't know where COVID would lead us. So I'm so grateful for the blessing that I get the opportunity to stand in the presence of God, to stand before these other teenagers my age and share God with them. And then in that circle, there was a boy named Oren. Now, Oren is special to me because the first children's class I ever taught was to a group of second, third, and fourth grade boys, about 11 of them. And to say that they are the reason that I am feisty is probably an understatement. They're the ones who taught me to hold my own in a classroom. But Oren was on staff with me. He's on staff with me. He's now 16 years old, and believe it or not, he's a little bit taller than I am at six foot two. And it got to his turn. And he said, well, the reason I feel called to do this is because there have been people in my life who have shown me God. There have been people in my life who proclaimed God's goodness to me. And if I get the chance to do that, and by some chance God finds happiness and glory in it, then who am I to pass it up? It's in that moment that I got a picture that maybe our teenagers know a little bit more than we sometimes give them credit for. In fact, maybe they know a little bit more than we do at times. 
because the adults in the room would say, well, Carolyn Dove called me. They needed a staff member, and you can't say no to Carolyn Dove. But it was the kids who focused on how glorifying this experience would be for God. Soli Deo Gloria, for the glory of God alone. This is a doctrine that means everything that is ever done, that will ever be done, should be done to the glory of God. It excludes all of humankind's selfish endeavors and puts our entire focus on God's glory. If we read through scripture traditionally, we will see glory as praising God. In fact, Joshua 7.19 says, Give glory to the Lord God of Israel. 1 Chronicles 16, verses 28 and 29 says, Give the Lord glory and strength. Give the Lord glory of his name. Psalm 62, 7 says, And God is my salvation and my glory. Jeremiah 13, 6 says, Give glory to the Lord your God. Over and over we hear this concept of glory. And in our scripture this morning, we hear it say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, The whole earth is full of your glory. Now you would think when this verse started that it would end with the whole world is full of your goodness or the whole world is full of your holiness, but it ends with the whole world is full of your glory. And what is God's glory in this moment but God's mercy and God's grace and God's blessings and God's love and God's goodness and everything that God is and does? poured out into God's people. See, we recognize what God's character is. We recognize that God is holy. We recognize that God's love is so deep. As we taught last week, he shed his deity, his divinity, for just a little while and stepped into human flesh where he died. We know God's mercy if we look back at our lives and see the times that God has shown up. We know God's faithfulness just by looking around us at the past year, what we've faced, and here we sit with God who continues to serve. God's glory. While I did not receive a ton of education on God's glory, it is used several times in the Bible. In fact, it's used over 200 times. The word and the concept of glory in our scripture. And as we talked in the very beginning, that scripture holds the truths that are necessary for our understanding of salvation. And one of those is God's glory. See, we understand that God's glory is the invisible qualities of God that are made visible in our lives through God's work in our lives. We understand that the glory of God is Jesus Christ, the man who suffered and died and raised from the dead to offer us a future. We understand that the glory of God is displayed in all of the teachings of our gospel messages. In the who's and the what's and the where God calls us to be, do, and go. We recognize that in everything God has ever done, in everything God will ever do, God's glory is found. We recognize that God's glory is us sitting in this room today. To the glory of God alone. To the glory of God alone, in God alone, through God alone. We remember that everything that is attributed to God is important in our lives and it's something that we must know because when it's when we know the full picture of who God is, when we can accurately describe who God is in our life, even when our language falls short, that's when we can step into this place of honoring and glorifying God. Therefore, part of our job in this discipleship journey is recognizing God's glory, learning it for ourselves, and making it an integral part of our lives. See, we know that God is merciful and just, We know that God is gracious, God is patient, God is holy, and above all, God is loving. And when we know those things, we can better live a life that honors God. 
You see, our whole lives are about God when we focus on God. Our, all of our actions, all of our words, all that we do and say are the things that glorify God when God encompasses all of who we are. Because the reality is, as Christians, we don't live in little boxes. We don't have the church box, and then we bring that out on Sundays, and then on Mondays through Fridays, we have the, the work box, and then we put that away for the weekend, and then we don't have the friend box that we only bring out when our friends are over, and the family box that we only bring out when our family is over, and we sure don't have a Jesus box that we only bring out when we need something. There's no way to live that life with these separate entities when our ultimate goal is to glorify God. Because the reality is, is all of those things, who we are at work, who we are at home, who we are with our friends, who we are at church, who we are in our Christian circles, are all the things that make up God's glory within us. And knowing that, we know that our words and our actions and the way that we portray God is important. We recognize that new life in Christ allows for our old self that divided ourselves into boxes to die away and instead this true being of who God created us to be, to stand firm and to stand tall, honoring God. It wasn't just church people who believed in the glory of God. It wasn't just pastors or theologians. But I'm sure some of y'all have heard of Bach, right? The, the famous pianist who composed many, many pieces. At the end of all of his pieces, he would write the letters S-D-G. Soli Deo Gloria. He truly believed that in every aspect of life, including his work of music, God was needed to be glorified. And he worked hard each and every day to make that possible. We recognize that scripture calls us, commands us to glorify God in all that we are. From the very beginning to the very end and everything in between, with our actions, with our words, what we say in a text message, in a phone call, what we write on Facebook, what we send in an email, what we think in our minds, what we feel in our hearts, God calls us to pay attention to that. Knowing that all of that is important when we glorify God. The final verse in our passage says, Though darkness covers the earth and gloom the nations, the Lord will shine upon you. God's glory will appear to you. Again, we are reminded that in the midst of those moments and lives where we don't know where to go forward, we don't know where the path is, we, we're stuck in the darkness, just as our faith is something we can anchor to, when we hold on to that, God's glory shines upon us and it's not the darkness we're sitting in anymore, but the presence of God. So if we know that our lives are meant to glorify God, what do we do and how do we live a life that does that? Well, I encourage you all to take a minute and to think about where you're comfortable. That little box that you say, I can do a whole bunch of things right here. You all got that place in your mind, the things you like to do and maybe the things that scare you? Now I encourage you to take that box and throw it as far away as possible. To step out of your comfort zone and to search for new ways that you can enhance the body of Christ, which will bring God glory in a way that you never thought was possible. Maybe it is starting a new ministry in a church. Maybe it is mentoring somebody who has been brought up into your life over and over again that you didn't think you were good enough to mentor. Maybe it's intentionally having conversation with people who you'd rather not. Whatever it may be, how can we live a life that glorifies God? These past five weeks, we've been going through the Sola series. And each week it was faith in scripture and grace and Jesus and God alone. We've been focusing on each aspect in the way that it by itself affects our life. But the truth is, none of it is ever done alone. You see, God's glory is both at the beginning and the end. 
of our four solas. The Holy Spirit inspired scriptures for the glory of God. Christ humbled himself to the point of death for the glory of God. Grace and mercy are offered to us rebellious sinners for God's glory. Justification by faith is offered to us alone as God's chosen people for God's glory. While we looked at all of these alone, that's not the end of the story. We now get to look at the full picture and see how all of these things work together so that who we are and how we go forward in Christ is a life that honors and glorifies the God who created us, who loves us, and calls us to be more than we ever fathomed possible. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the ways that you show up in our lives. From the very beginning to the very end, for the ways that you have been found in the scriptures and in the grace and the mercy and the faith and in Christ, Lord, we praise your name. Lord, as we go forward, help us to live a life that glorifies you, that holds you in the center of all of who we are. Help us to love you in a way that is far bigger than we ever imagined possible and to love others with that same deep love. When we fall short, continue to call us home, offering us grace, putting scripture back in our life, reminding us to remain faithful to the Christ who died and rose again to offer us the way back all for God's glory. Amen. Normally this would be the time.